Good morning, I'm Larissa and I will be your reader today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you would please join with me, we will read Psalm 90 verses one through six responsively. Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. For you, a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear. They are like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. Our opening prayer. Father in heaven, Send your spirit to guide us in this time of worship. Bring us to your throne so we can find forgiveness and healing. In Jesus' name, amen. As we worship today, we light this candle to remind us that Christ is present among us. And we worship in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Bible tells us, and we all know from our own lives, the world doesn't work the way it is supposed to. It is broken, and this brokenness affects our relationships with God and each other. Unfortunately, we're unable to fix what is broken because we ourselves are broken. We call this brokenness sin, and as the Bible says, if we claim that we're free of sin, we're only fooling ourselves. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, God will forgive us. Once forgiven, our relationship with God is repaired, and the basis for repairing our relationships with each other is established. Let us spend a few moments together now and confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. Father in heaven, we are broken and need your help. We ask you to forgive whatever sins we have committed. Guide us so that your forgiveness overcomes our broken lives. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is merciful, and so I say to you this day that your sins have been forgiven. To make sure that you know your sins are forgiven, God's own Son, Jesus Christ, gave up his life on the cross for you. So let go of the burdens that weigh you down and give them to Jesus and celebrate this new opportunity that God has given you. Amen.
If you will please join with me as we pray our prayer of the day. Almighty God, each day we see your generous goodness. Give us hearts that recognize and acknowledge that goodness so that we will live lives of thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying, everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. And there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that, whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you already are doing. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading today comes from Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. On that day, says the Lord, a cry of alarm will come from the fish gate and echo throughout the new quarter of the city, and a great crash will sound from the hills. Wail in sorrow, all you who live in the market area, for all the merchants and traders will be destroyed. I will search with lanterns in Jerusalem's darkest corners to punish those who sit complacent in their sins. They think the Lord will do nothing to them, either good or bad. So their property will be plundered. Their homes will be ransacked. They will build new homes, but never live in them. They will plant vineyards, but never drink wine from them. That terrible day of the Lord is near. Swiftly it comes, a day of bitter tears, a day when even strong men will cry out. It will be a day when the Lord's anger is poured out a day of terrible distress and anguish, a day of ruin and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet calls and battle cries. Down go the walled cities and the strongest battlements. Word of God, word of life. Before my sermon today, I want to do something I've never done before, and that is issue a parental guidance warning before the sermon. The subject matter, the topic, uh, comes from Genesis chapter 34, and it is one that is very serious and what we would call adult in nature. And I wanted uh, parents to be aware of that. Also, uh, dealing with some trauma that potentially some people here have had their lives touched by and do not want them to be caught by surprise. Um, We are dealing with uh, what is the story is usually headlined in the Bible as the rape of Dinah. That is is one of Jacob's, uh, it is Jacob's only daughter who is talked about in, in the Bible. So, so this is our seventh of eight sermons on the life of Jacob. Uh, We are getting down towards the end here, but he's still not home. He still is technically on his way home. He took a a trip to the side, as it were. So I want to quick review his family here uh, before we move on to the story itself. We have on this slide here his wives, Rachel and Leah, and Bilhah and Zilpah, and all of their children. And you notice one of them, when you look at over in the top left with Leah's children, there are the six boys, and then a girl. That girl is Dinah. She's not played much of a role so far 
in the story of Jacob's life. She's been mentioned along with the mentioning of the others, uh, but she becomes very important now. And another thing also I mentioned last week, when we're looking to the future uh, in the Bible, not our future, the future in the Bible of this story, that it is through Leah that the priests of Israel who who will go before God with their offerings come. And it is through Leah that the kings of Israel will come. And it is through Leah, ultimately, that the lineage leads us to Jesus. Not, not Rachel, who was Jacob's favorite, but Leah. And so it's significant that this is Leah's daughter. She is the daughter of the one that God said, it says in the Bible that God saw she was not loved, so he gave her children. And, and um, so what happened was Jacob was supposed to follow his brother Esau and go back to the promised land, back home where he would inherit this land promised to his grandfather Abram and his father Isaac and now to him. Instead of following his brother home, he goes the other direction. And he ends up in a land called Shechem. And he buys a parcel of land there for his family to live on. It's his extended family. He has his four wives. He has his 12 kids. And he has all the people who work for him and all of his uh, sheep and cattle and goats and all of those things. So he buys land to live there instead of going home. So one day, this is Genesis 34, Verse 1, one day Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went to visit some of the young women of the land. Dinah's a teenager, and she has 11 brothers. She's lonely. She wants to make some friends. But we get, uh, we get a sort of a foreshadowing of what's about to happen as, as Dinah goes out to meet some people finally find some girls her own age to hang out with. And, but it says they are young women of the land. That is a phrase that's used in the Old Testament to talk about them. There's us and there's them. There's, from, from the perspective of Jacob and his family, there's us, there's the people that God has, has made this promise to. We are the people that God called Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and all of us to be his people, and then there's them. People of the land is them. They're people of the land, not people of the promise. So it's foreshadowing bad things to come. But when the local prince Shechem saw son of Hamar, the Hivite, saw Dinah, he seized her and raped her. He is the local spoiled rich kid. And what we're going to see in Shechem is uh, a pattern of behavior that we see today in sexual predators. There's no, it's, it's classic behavior of a sexual predator, what we see in Shechem. He is the spoiled rich kid. His dad is the local kind of boss, the local strong man. So he's used to doing what he wants. And he's probably treating Dinah the way he treats other women. Now, one of the most depressing things in preparing for this sermon is if I read anything written in the past, they always blamed Dinah for this. Always. Going way back to uh, a guy named Josephus who lived just a generation after Jesus. He was a Jewish writer. And he said Dinah was out uh, being involved in some, uh, you know, really bad pagan religious rituals. And this was part of it. But there's nothing in the text to even suggest that. And it's not even remotely suggested in the text. There's nothing going on here except a teenage girl who's looking for friends. We get to the Middle Ages, and, and, the, and there uh, many writers say uh, that she wasn't raped, that, that Shechem and Dinah had a thing And they were trying to make their parents let them get married. But the text is is unambiguous. The text says, Dinah went out to to visit the local young women and Shechem raped her. It it is cut and dry. There There is no blame to be placed on Dinah here. 
I, unfortunately, in my work as a military chaplain, this is a topic that I've had to deal with many times. And I can tell you the number of times that a female soldier has been sexually assaulted and that it was that she did something to perpetuate it, that number is pretty close to zero. They are predators. They are people who brutalize those who are weaker. And that is what Shechem has done to Dinah. He has brutalized her and attacked her. And then the next verse says, he fell in love with her. I would like to say that he's just obsessed with her or he lusts after her, but that's not what the text says. And if I'm going to follow what the text says at the beginning, where, where Dinah is an innocent victim here, I also have to follow what the text says here. And that is that he fell in love with her. He attempted to win her affection by speaking tenderly. This is classic sexual predator behavior. You brutalize somebody, and then you try and convince them that, that there was no brutality by speaking tenderly. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, and said, get me this girl to be my wife. Dad, go to her dad and buy her for me. He's the spoiled rich kid. His dad is the local boss, the local strong man. This is what they do. They want something, they take it. If they can't take it, they buy it. So soon, Jacob heard that Shechem had defiled his daughter, Dinah. But since his sons were out in the fields herding his livestock, he said nothing until they returned. Then Hamor, Shechem's father, came to discuss the matter with Jacob. So here's what we have. We have, we have Jacob whose teenage daughter has just been raped, and now the father of the person who did it comes to see him. And he's going to ask, what will it take for your daughter to marry my son? Meanwhile, Jacob's sons had come in from the field. As soon as they heard what had happened, they were shocked and furious that their sister had been raped. Shechem had done a disgraceful thing against Jacob's family, something that should never be done. The, the brothers view the assault on their sister as an assault on all of them because they're responsible for her safety. This isn't about honor. As some will try and, and say this is, oh, their honor is hurt. It's not their honor that's hurt. It's their sister. And they are furious. It's, it's interesting. The sort of the, the sensibilities and the mentalities that we read later in the Bible, they haven't come into existence yet. We haven't had... The stability of, of governments and empires haven't been introduced yet. And, and so there are some who want to blame Dinah because, oh, you know, in the ancient world, women didn't go out alone. They had to be escorted and all this. That comes later. Right now, it's just a bunch of people living there. And, and, and what was done to Dinah, they say, should never be done. But Shechem did it, and, and we see evidence here that he's, this isn't the first time that he's a predator. And, and so even though sort of these sensibilities and these cultural norms aren't in place yet, we see the forerunners from them. We see in Shechem, we see a culture developing in which women have no say, and they are property to be used and abused however a man sees fit. And that is what most of the ancient world became. Women were voiceless. We see in the brothers something different. Their sister was raped and brutalized. They say this should never be done. 
And what, what happens in, in ancient Jewish culture is that women are protected under the law. That women aren't property. They don't have all the rights that men have. They, they certainly weren't living in the 21st century. But women are seen as human. They're seen as equal partners in many ways. And, and, and it's in contrast to most of the cultures around them. These, these rights that, that women have and legal protections that women have. We already see that starting to develop in these contrasting cultures. Hamor tried to speak with Jacob and his sons. Now imagine this picture. Here's, here's Hamor and Shechem on one side, and here's the brothers of Dinah on the other side, and Jacob in the middle, and Hamor and Shechem want to negotiate a marriage with Jacob, while on the other side of him, his sons are saying, your daughter was brutalized, and assaulted and raped, what are you going to do about it? So Hamor says, my son Shechem is truly in love with your daughter. I can only imagine the 11 brothers saying, he has a really weird way, and an odd way of showing that love. So he says, please let him marry her. In fact, let's arrange other marriages too. We have an opportunity here, Hamor says, to bring our people together. I know... Uh, my son, your daughter, they got off to a rocky start. But let's put that behind us. You give us your daughters for our sons, and we'll give you our daughters for your sons. And you may live among us. The land is open to you. Settle here and trade with us. And feel free to buy property in the area. Let's become one people, Hamor is saying. Let's bring our people together. Then Shechem himself spoke to Dinah's father and brothers. Please be kind to me and let me marry her, he begged. I will give you whatever you ask. No matter what dowry or gift you demand, I will gladly pay it. Just give me the girl as my wife. Now, we've seen this before. Laban, Jacob's father-in-law, sold his sister he sold his two daughters. If Shechem was talking to Laban, he'd start talking dollar figures here. Just how much can I get from this guy? But we see a difference here. Jacob is not Laban, and his sons are not Laban. But since Shechem had defiled their sister, Dinah, Jacob's sons responded deceitfully. They are their grandmother's grandsons, because that's the first thing that Rebecca would always look for an angle. They answered deceitfully to Shechem and his father Hamor. They said to them, we couldn't possibly allow this, because you're not circumcised. You see, all the stuff that's to come, the temple, the tabernacle, all the sacrifices, the worship, the Ten Commandments, the rules, the laws, none of that exists yet. All they have is circumcision as a sign of the promise. It's their one thing. So they're saying, you have to, you're you're not part of the promise. So it would be disgraceful for our sister to marry a man like you. But here's a solution. If every man among you will be circumcised like we are, then we'll give you our daughters and we'll take your daughters for ourselves. We will live among you and become one people, just like you asked for, Hamor. We'll become one people. But if you don't agree to be circumcised, well, we'll take her and we'll just go live somewhere else. We'll be on our way. We're told they answered deceitfully, but we don't know what the deceit is yet. But Hamor and his son Shechem agreed to this proposal. And Shechem wasted no time in acting on this request, for he wanted Jacob's daughter desperately. Shechem was a highly respected member of his family, and he went to his father Hamar to present the proposal to the leaders at the town gate. At the entrance to their little village, town gate really sounds fancy, it's, it's, it's probably just a collection of tents, might not even have any permanent buildings there. But they have a space that's the entrance, and that's where they meet. It's a combination city hall slash coffee shop. And that's where they meet. 
they told them, these men are our friends. Let's invite them to live here among us and trade freely. Now watch where this goes. He says, look, the land is large enough to hold them. We can take their daughters as wives and let them marry ours. But they will consider staying here and becoming one people with us only if our men are circumcised, just as they are. It's a weird cultural thing they've got going. If we do it, if we do that, all their livestock and possessions will eventually become ours. It's simple mathematics, he's saying. There's more of us than them. If they marry our daughters and we marry their daughters, there's more of us, so we'll have more kids, and everything they have, all that wealth over there, becomes ours. It's not a merger. It's a takeover. Come, let us agree to their terms and let them settle among us. So all the men in the town council agreed, and Hamor and Shechem and every male in the town was circumcised. But... Three days later, when their wounds were still sore, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, who were Dinah's full brothers, they're also sons of Leah, took their swords and entered the town without opposition. Then they slaughtered every male there, including Hamor and his son Shechem. They killed them with their swords, then took Dinah from Shechem's house and return to their camp. They've just killed every man in this village because of what one of them did. This is not an action that's endorsed by God in any way, shape, or form, any more than what began it was. This is a tragedy uh, that, is, that, is, that, that has its roots in Jacob not going home. Jacob did not go to the promised land. He did not go to the land he was going to inherit. Instead, he went to a different land, and he bought land to live on for him and his family. And he put his entire family at jeopardy. And now he, he, he put his daughter in a position to be brutalized and raped, and he put his sons in a position where they believed the only response was to kill the people who did it. This is, this is uh, you could compare it to uh, uh, the Hatfield and McCoy kind of thing. Compare it to uh, a gang warfare in an inner city or to a mafia, you know, between two mafia families. That's, you know, you hurt us, we're going to hurt you twice as much. That's what the brother, that's what Simeon and Levi have done here. Levi, whose descendants will be the priests of Israel. Meanwhile, the rest of Jacob's sons arrived, finding the men slaughtered. They plundered the town because of their, their sister had been defiled there. They seized all the flocks and herds and donkeys, everything they could lay their hands on, both inside the town and outside in the fields. They looted all their wealth and plundered their houses. They also took all their little children and wives and led them away as captives." Shechem and his father told the other men, if we marry them, if we do this one simple thing, we'll absorb them and all their wealth will be ours. But we see here what happens in just the opposite, is that the sons of Jacob take everything. And there is no more Shechem. The, t the town, the, the, the son is named Shechem after the town. The town is no more. It's gone. It's just a charred, just a charred wreck of an old village. So afterwards, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have ruined me. You've made me stink among all the people of this land, among all the Canaanites and Perizzites. We are so few that they will join forces and crush us. There are other little villages. There are other families out there. And he's saying they're good. they will not stand for this. We've destabilized the area. I'll be ruined. And my entire household will be wiped out. This is Jacob's constant worry. He was worried his father-in-law Laban was going to kill him and take everything he had. He was worried his brother Esau would kill him and take everything he had. Now he's worried that the, the other locals will kill him and take everything he has. 
because of what his sons have done. But they say to him, why should we let him treat our sister like a whore? Some translations put that as a prostitute, but it's, it's not, that's a different word. They're saying, look what he did. He did something that should never be done. And we stopped him. Maybe what we did is a bad thing, but it's not worse than what he did. He did that to our sister. He did that to us. This is such a tragedy. Judges chapter 20, where there's a civil war between the tribes of Israel, the descendants of these people, might be the only passage in the Old Testament that is more tragic and more heartbreaking. There's no winners here. There's no good guys. We have a we have a uh, a teenage girl trying to meet some friends in a new neighborhood who is brutalized by someone who probably treated all women that way. We have her brothers reacting in a, a way that brings death and destruction. We have her father doing nothing. And we have nothing from God. The only reference to God in all of this is, is, is they mention circumcision, the sign of the promise, and they misuse it to deceive people. Finally, we hear from God. We have to turn the page to chapter 35, verse 1. God said to Jacob, Arise, go to Bethel, and settle there. That's where God told him to go in the first place. He said, Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled your brother Esau. All those years ago, when he was running away from home, and he had this vision of the stairway up to heaven, and he built an altar. He said, go back to that spot and build an altar. You were supposed to be there all the time. It's where you were supposed to go. This, this passage in, in Genesis 34, it lays bare the brokenness of the world in its stark reality. And, and people say, well, what's the point? The point is, this is a world without God. That's what it looks like. If, if we did not have a loving God to bring us his grace and mercy and love, this is what it, will, this is what it looks like. This is what too much of the world still looks like. Arise and go to Bethel. Bethel, Beth house, El, God. Arise and go to the house of God, he says, Jacob. You've lived here too long. You weren't supposed to live here at all. It's a heartbreaking story, and it's a hard reminder of just how much God's grace and mercy and love are worth. Let us pray. Lord God, as we gather together to worship you, whether we are here at church or gathered together with our families at home or by ourselves watching online, we pray that we would never take your grace and mercy for granted or forget that it is what brings goodness into our lives. We pray that we would live that goodness every day. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us join together and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we honor you this morning as the one who sacrificed himself for us. Help and guide us to live in grateful response to your grace and mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask that you give us thankful hearts this coming week. As we reflect on the bounty of our lives and our many blessings, remind us that all good things come from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the United States, for our elected leaders, and for those who serve in our military. Keep us strong and humble as a nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling in their physical, emotional, or mental health, and we ask that you touch them with your healing hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us thankful hearts in this coming week as we seek to serve you in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are preparing to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. If you're watching this online and would like to participate, feel free to pause the video and gather together what you will need for, uh, for wine or juice and the bread. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you created us in your image. When we fell, your son came to lift us up. In this meal, we not only remember what Jesus did for us, but through faith we receive the forgiveness he promises to us. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now let us join together in the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. If you would please join with me in our closing prayer. Lord, we pray that our time here will bless and guide us in the week to come. Plant your word deep in our hearts so that it will be a path before us, leading us to walk in your way so that we are a blessing to those around us. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. 
Come broken hearted, let rescue begin Come find your mercy, O oh sinner come near Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal So lay down your burdens Lay down your shame All who are broken Lift up your face Oh, wanderer, come home You're not too far So lay Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.